Good morning, all. My name is Ami Kotecha, and as chair of the COOLS ESG Forum, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this morning's webinar, kindly sponsored by Savills. Today, our panelists will discuss biodiversity net gain and the impact of recent legislation that requires new development in the UK to be nature positive. One of the key objectives as the ESG Forum at COOLS that we have is to bring to you experts from a broad ranging set of views. So from academics, from policy, from industry practice and from, uh, and from professionals uh, who can bring to you a variety of views on a particular topic that can sometimes be quite complex to navigate such as this morning's topic and hopefully we we'll leave you with a succinct and useful understanding that you can then put into practice as part of your responsible investment development um, and, and work in the built environment sector. We'd like to encourage Q&A throughout the discussion. If you've been to one, uh, one of our webinars before, we, you, will, you will know that we have a very lively Q&A session um, that, that we host. So please do start putting your questions on, uh, using the Q&A function on, on, on your Zoom. And um, so now I'd like to hand over to John Deersley, who's going to be our moderator for this morning's session. John is Rural Director and Head of Natural Capital at Savills, and he will kick off the session by introducing our panelists um, and, uh, and taking over from me. So over to you, John. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Amy, and good morning, everybody. Uh, very exciting to see the number of people tick up as we sort of opened up the webinar on this. I think for me, that just confirms the fact that BNG really has sort of captured people's thought processes. Um, it's actually been quite a long burn, I think, getting to this point where we now have BNG mandated for the vast majority of developments. Um, but actually really exciting to see this marketplace and um, uh, opportunity, I suppose, for biodiversity recovery come to the front. I fully appreciate that um, with every new marketplace, there's some challenges. Um, but I think what we're really excited to do today is explore both from the sort of supply side, the land manager side, the design side, and also the sort of finance piece around this, as well as the developers um, commentary. And of course, through everyone attending to Q and A's as well, how biodiversity net gain is going to play out over the next few years. And ultimately how we as a sector are gonna be able to help support sort of biodiversity recovery. Um, the plan for this morning is to welcome various speakers, and I'm not going to name them all now, but let them introduce themselves, who could give three or four minutes on um, you know, their, their role in biodiversity net gain and how they implement into this sector, and also their initial thoughts on the topic. And then after that, we welcome sort of Q&A. Um, I fully confess I've got some scribbled in a book, but I would love to hear more from what um, everyone on the webinar is, is thinking, so please do put those in the Q&A function. Um, Tony, could I ask you to turn on your camera and unmute and maybe kick us off on you know, who you are and where you come from? And dare I say that that reference is getting weaker and weaker for people who get it. Thank you very much uh, indeed, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Tony Juniper. Um, I uh, have been involved with environmental conservation, sustainability subjects for, for 40 years now in many different guises, uh, being the director at Friends of the Earth. Uh, working at WWF for a period, advising the Prince of Wales, now His Majesty the King, on environmental subjects, being a writer, working with business, and now um, my main role in life, alongside being a fellow with the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, is to be the chairman of Natural England. And so Natural England is the government's advisory body uh, on conservation and the natural environment. I've been in post there for five years, and one of the themes that has dominated my term of office has been the progressive development of this new policy called biodiversity net gain. And as John said, it's been in gestation for quite a period. And one of our board members reminded me the other day that she was first involved with conversations on this subject uh, with government back in 2008. And so that's quite a long time ago now. And it has been something which has uh, been the subject of intense debate and investigation at Natural England. We've been the official technical advisors on how to piece together this policy. And the breakthrough really came uh, in 2018 with the publication of the 25 year environment plan, which said we're going to leave the environment in a better state than we found it. So the idea of better rather than protection um, entered into the, the policy making world. 
and then the biodiversity net gain uh, idea finished up being one of the central policies in the 2021 Environment Act, uh, leading to the launch of this new policy earlier this month, February 2024. And so basically what we've got now is a legal, legally underpinned mechanism which will require people to measure the state of biodiversity in a place where houses are going to be built and later on and commercial properties and later on also infrastructure and to measure the biodiversity before those construction projects go ahead and have a legal requirement to replace with a 10 percent on top uplift that level of biodiversity uh, elsewhere in the landscape with the priority being to do it close to where the development will take place and i'm sure we'll talk more about that particular dimension later on. And what we've got is, is a metric. Uh, you'll hear a lot about the biodiversity metric, I'm sure, on this call, which is an attempt to try and come with a standard measurement uh, regime whereby we can all understand what's being lost and therefore what needs to be gained and to be able to measure that um, uh, as closely as we can. So that's my connection with this, John, and very much looking forward to hearing other panellists' uh, perspectives. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Tony. Um, Phoebe, perhaps you could go next for me. Yeah, thank you so much, John, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Phoebe Tucker, and I am a nature associate at the Green Finance Institute. And we're an independent organisation uh, dedicated to unlocking private capital for sustainable outcomes and helping the UK economy transition to a net zero and nature positive state. So my team specifically focuses on developing ideas and solutions that are going to channel private capital into nature at scale uh, for nature restoration and also nature positive outcomes. Um, so our team works across three pillars to deliver this. We, uh, we work on supply, demand and enabling policy and market infrastructure. So on the supply side, uh, we are an advisor and assessor to uh, the two largest investment readiness funds in the UK, NERF and Firms, uh, and I can go into a little bit more detail on that later. Uh, but tied to that work, we've also developed uh, two toolkits for project developers to understand how to build nature-based projects that can access private finance, such as through uh, BNG. And uh, we've done that specifically to develop the and accelerate the pipeline of projects in the UK. Uh, on the demand side, we lead the UK National Consultation Group on the TNFD, the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, and that comprises over 500 businesses across various sectors and nearly 50 early adopters of the framework. Um, we've also formed the GFI's Financial Institutions for Nature Group that brings together banks, insurers, asset managers and venture capital to understand what is going to unlock interest from the financial sector into nature. And then Finally, we uh, we focus also on the enabling policy and market infrastructure. So I think uh, everyone will, will agree that um, the private sector and public sector needs to work closely in order for the capital flows to be most effective. So we work closely with central government, uh, including in England and in Scotland, to set out how they can best align private capital flows with government targets, uh, policies and funding. So my work specifically, uh, I lead on UK nature markets, which of course includes the market for uh, offsite biodiversity units that's underpinned by uh, biodiversity net gain policy. And for the last two years, I've been focusing on nature markets to understand what makes them work successfully and uh, what is needed from the supply side, the demand side and the market infrastructure side to really deliver um, uh, nature positive outcomes. Um, and so naturally, with BNG being a compliance market, we believe that this is uh, the largest opportunity to uh, channel private finance into nature in England. And we've just hosted a sprint working group of about 40 market stakeholders to understand the top priorities uh, to focus on in the near term. And um, now that BNG has been launched, uh, uh, we are developing a roadmap that will hopefully uh, support DEFRA and Natural England in ensuring the success of BNG it is, as it is rolled out. Um, and so I'm personally delighted to be here today to discuss this very topic with such a wide audience. And I'd like to thank um, CULS for inviting me. Brilliant. Thanks, Phoebe. You described that very well, though how you herd that many cats into some sort of meaningful shape, I have no idea. Um, it's tough. <laughs> could you give us a, a quick intro? 
Yes, hello. Um, uh, so I'm Morgan Taylor. Uh, I'm one of the directors at Greengage. We are a multidisciplinary environmental consultancy um, based in London with, with uh, offices in, in Sheffield, Manchester and Bristol as well. Now started as a very small consultancy kind of 12 years ago and now um, uh, with partly thanks to how BNG and the, the increased drive of interest and in mainstreaming of biodiversity in construction and in the planning process, we're now thrilled that it's a, it's a sought after uh, uh, concept in, in design. So practically speaking, uh, how I, I'm kind of engaged in BNG. So so we've been closely engaged in in development of it from from the start. Closely interested in, in its evolution. Um, I was on the the British Standard Panel uh, for for, for uh, the BS for for BNG. Helped contribute to, towards uh, best practice for that and contributed very early uh, case studies of where we were retrofitting at the time the offsetting metric um, uh, to to try and do some good for gains rather than no net loss um practically speaking we're the people on the ground that will do the field surveys we'll do the assessments we will be sitting in the design team meetings with the with the um the developers and actually saying that this is how you can go about delivering bng um Practically speaking, I'm a, a chartered environmentalist. I still, still technically an ecologist. Keep my eye in with my uh, my bat and uh, dormouse licenses still. Um, uh, but increasingly, uh, I'm pulled more into the world of how BNG fits within the wider concept of ESG. So not just within the confines of of uh, policy um, and legislative led BNG related action, um, which hopefully we'll get onto uh, in a bit. Um, but the main thing that that excites me about BNG is that look, as ecologists, we now have a seat at the table. There's 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 real interest in an acknowledgement of the value of nature for development and for assets, um, especially with this evolution of, of wider nature markets. So um yeah, interested to uh, to get stuck in. Brilliant, thanks, Morgan. And it's great to see Q and A um, questions coming in. Please do keep them coming. We're going to come to those in a moment. Um, Tony, you, you mentioned that this has been in gestation for quite a long time. I suppose the million dollar question to kick us off is, you know, why is this, uh, I think, the first compliance biodiversity market? You know, why are we doing this here in the UK or in England, I should say, for BNG? Uh, well, um, it, 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 it bubbled through, as I say, that 25 year environment plan and the notion of leaving the environment in a better state than we found it. And so naturally, then you're invited to think about the toolkit that we've got to do that. And if you look back at what we've been doing over the previous 70 years of policy making and passing of laws, it's really been a conservation toolkit that we've had, which has been trying to protect the remaining remnants of nature rather than thinking about recovery. And if you're going to go from halting decline and into recovery, well, the first thing you have to do is, is stop things disappearing and to maintain the level of habitat and biodiversity net gain does a piece of that in relation to development, but then also adds um, a little bit on top. Uh, to enable us to to have that increase in the available uh, uh, areas for for high quality wildlife, and this um, you know the, 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 there's another level to this which I think uh, is really important to have in mind, and that's about how we deploy biodiversity net gain in a more strategic context. Uh, so one of the things that we know is that the reason we're struggling to halt species decline in this country is because of the lack of connectivity in the landscape. So can we use biodiversity net gain to be able to start reconnecting what are now fragmented habitats? And there is a premium built into the uh, system to give a little incentive to uh, recognise where habitats are being reconnected uh, as well as being recreated. So, it's, you know, if you, if you put a piece of habitat in one bit of the landscape, it's going to be pretty good. If you put it in a different bit of the landscape where it connects up two pieces that have that are that are that are separated uh, by historic land use change, then the benefit of that is going to be so much bigger ecologically. And so at Natural England, one of the things we're trying to think through is how to deliver on what is a central plank of current policy making in relation to nature recovery, which is the idea of a nature recovery network. So on top of having protected areas, uh, the uh, creation of new habitat coming from farming incentives, the creation of new habitat coming from biodiversity net gain, 
the work of the RSPB, the local wildlife trusts, what water companies might do to improve the quality of a river, what the environment agency might do to uh, improve, uh, reduce flood risk in, in an area, what the Forestry Commission might do in targeting woodland. If you could imagine all of these as being individual jigsaw pieces and then putting them together in the landscape to make the best ecological sense is a step that we're um, very much having in mind as we think about the work of, of Natural England going forward. And the other thing to bear in mind, which is really, Really, really important is that in the same legislation that gave us biodiversity net gain we also had the establishment of local nature recovery strategies which basically will hopefully give us the picture on the box of the jigsaw if you will i'm stretching my analogies a bit far now but hopefully uh you know through those local nature recovery strategies what we will be able to achieve is something which, which is fundamentally important and that is to co-design uh, at a broad level, it's not a top down kind of bureaucratic process, but at a broad level to understand at the level of a county, you know, how do we blend in the development, the infrastructure, the housing and the industry in a way whereby we can also accommodate nature recovery? Because we don't really do that at the moment. What we do is we um, derive um, some priorities for, for built development. The ecologists are off somewhere else designing a nature network or a, or a protected site or a nature recovery project. And then when we put the two together, we realise they don't match and a massive argument breaks out and people go to court and get banners and everything else. Is it possible for us to avoid that by doing more integrated planning? And my suggestion would be that, yes, we can do that, um, but it's going to require a slightly different mindset. But the biodiversity net gain, uh, as, as, as was said by Morgan a moment ago, you know, it brings the ecologists to the table. And so hopefully what we can do with this portal, this opening into that discussion is to start thinking more strategically along those lines I just described, whereby the local nature recovery strategies become a very important kind of co-process alongside the biodiversity net gain, and whereby we can bring in all these different actors to hopefully do something which leads to outcomes that are better than the sum of the parts, if you will. I think that's brilliant. Actually, that leads really nicely into a question we've had in the chat. Um, Morgan, it's probably one for you, but, but Anthony was here asking, you know, what's the practical delivery of this on the ground? I mean, it's all very well having this sort of framework up the yeah. top, but I'm yeah. sat in a building with several hundred people all competing with objectives for what these buildings, developments should look like and feel like, et cetera. Market viability being very core. Cool. What mm. are your clients more than seeing actually in terms of designing sites? You know, what's this, what effects is this happening? So, so it's a really good question. I mean, we of course have to, we've got to follow the mitigation hierarchy. So at first we've got to deliver as much habitat on site as possible um, and importantly that's really crucial to maintain because we don't want to say that we will have people there and we'll have nature over here so practically speaking it's green infrastructure it's nature but it's yeah. integrated nature-based solutions so so we are looking at in, in an urban and, and peri-urban environment it's well-designed biodiverse roofs it's well-designed rain gardens suds Street trees uh, uh, are kind of um, scored very highly in the metric. Um, further afield, we are looking at where we have greenfield housing, dedicated green spaces created for nature um, in mind, not just vast areas of mown, uh, modified grass and amenity grass, and just because that's the green bit of the development. So we'll just put some some turf over there and that and that's that's left as is so it's about bringing nature into where we are building and where we live and importantly the the fact that we we can now actually because we are being brought into these design discussions we can actually give the advice of saying that if you were to change this integrated green infrastructure in this slightly different way you could actually improve the performance of the building through optimizing living roof design which also optimizes your bng outcome you could change the performance of the the street level rain garden um planting uh, specification to actually integrate ecosystem services into this development as well so in practice we're applying bng not just to get the numbers and make the numbers work because whilst it is with we have to make those numbers work for, for from a planning perspective it's also important to not just be entirely led by what the percentage outcome is, rather ensure that we are delivering the right habitats, obviously in line with the LNRSs and the targets that Tony rightly points out, but also the actual ecosystem service needs that these places um, have when we're building them. Uh, because for, for decades, we've built spaces without considering that by decoupling these concepts. Um, so, so 
practically speaking, we're talking green infrastructure, we're talking MBS nature-based solutions. Um, and importantly, that makes for better placemaking. Well, that's helpful, thank you. Phoebe, you're here looking at bringing finance into this. And for me, finance really relates to the offsite mitigation of BNG, because mm -hmm. you're actually being able to take dedicated pieces of land, you know, back to the Norton principles of, you know, how we how we use uh, or deploy nature, I suppose. Ultimately, what do you see as the challenges between the metric favouring on-site delivery versus perhaps the finance and or some of the Lawton principles of off-site delivery? Have you, have you had any concept around that? Yeah, no. So, um, well, before I start, I just want to say that uh, uh, BNG is such an incredible opportunity and having worked with the supply side and the off-site deliverers, as you say, for the past two years, uh, it's clear to us the impact that this policy can have. Um, and so with anything uh, of such scale and ambition, there are naturally going to be some challenges to address as it's rolled out. Um, it might be helpful to uh, go over the, the five top priorities that the working group we convened identified to focus on the near term, uh, which I think a lot of you will be familiar with, and I'm, I'm keen to hear your thoughts, but uh, they're worth reiterating or iterating here. Um, so number one, there does seem to be uh, a lack of a level playing field between on-site BNG delivery and off-site uh, off delivery. So uh, it's great, uh, as Morgan has said, that uh, developers can meet their BNG, um, their BNG uh, requirements on-site because that means they're incorporating more nature uh, onto the site and uh, you know, that's, that's great for everyone. However, the, uh, the rules compared to off-site delivery are less stringent and therefore there's a risk that much of this biodiversity uplift uh, might not actually be delivered over 30 years. And so this paired with the fact that uh, more on-site delivery translates to less demand for off-site delivery means that uh, a lot of private sector capital may be drained away from robust environmental outcomes. Um, so things like the, uh, the lack of a registry for on-site gains, which I know is a very tricky subject, and um, yeah, uh, the, the enforcement that LPAs can, uh, can apply to on-site delivery. These are things that we'd like to see addressed. Um, the second challenge would be the need for greater resourcing for local authorities. And I think it's not lost on anyone that um, LAs will play a crucial role in the success of BNG. So not just the ecologists and the LPA function that assess the BNG applications and look through the metric, um, but, you know, the lawyers, the, the project managers, the landscape teams, the, the, the people in the LNRS teams who are responsible for marrying BNG with uh, the, the greater strategy, um, you know, these local authorities are developing a myriad of processes and operations, uh, often from scratch. And I realise that the New Burdens funding has been announced, but I think a lot of people are wondering whether it's enough and perhaps wanting other forms of support from central government, such as an extension of the support uh, provided by the Planning Advisory Service. Um, another one would be uh, greater clarity over tax accounting, tax and accounting treatments. Uh, which I think has already been called out in the Q&A, so that's good to see. Um, you know, speaking as a farmer's daughter, the, uh, for example, the fact that um, uh, in, uh, agricultural property relief for inheritance tax hasn't been clarified, that's a huge blocker um, for farmers. But also, you know, there are other examples uh, for landowners, uh, such as, as charities, that are really seeking clarity to ensure that they know exactly what their tax bill is going to be. So we're really grateful for HMRC's consultation 2023, and we're looking forward to receiving further guidance on that topic later on. Um, the fourth is stronger governance over monitoring and maintenance burdens for both on-site and off-site delivery. So for example, how the funds uh, to monitor and maintain these habitats over 30 years, how they're, um, how they're set aside, how they're managed, uh, how much, for example, should local authorities ask for, um, you know, more clarity on that would be great. And then finally, uh, I think we need greater clarity over the use of S106 agreements and conservation covenants. Uh, which are essentially how the land being used for BNG offsite is legally bound for 30 years. So what we've heard is that there are a variety of different approaches being taken. Some are um, more robust than others. Some make more sense. Some are very tailored to the specific environments that they're applied in. Um, so more consistency uh, and more guidance would be great there. Um, but these are just the, the high priority ones. Those are the five that we set out in our report. And I think it's important to be vi vigilant 
and listen as things on the ground play out. So, um, for example, uh, further challenges that come about might be, uh, as you say, with the metric, uh, I acknowledge that there have already been several uh, iterations, several versions. But I think, you know, as the market develops and we start to see these outcomes, it would be great to uh, see how it's working in practice and then be quick to feed that back into things like the metric, but also the provision of market data for uh, for all market actors um, and potentially spot some challenges that might surface that people hadn't thought about to begin with. Uh, so for example, um, is there a risk of international purchase of land coming in and you know, private equity from abroad buying up lots of potential offsite delivery uh, opportunities? And I mean, that's something that we heard uh, the other day, and we're keen to build that into our work going forward. Thanks, BB. I mean, Tony, I appreciate that you will be a consultee to this process rather than the ultimate decision making on it um, on a lot of those points. But yeah, we, this has been a slow brewing topic, as we heard earlier on. And yet Phoebe's just articulated quite a number of challenges, which she still yeah. feels are, are there. Does either Natural England or your work with central government, does it have a, a roadmap? How are you planning to review and uh, adapt policy, I suppose. Yeah, so Phoebe gave us a very good summary of some of the questions there. Um, so this is, well, I mean, we're literally in month one. We've not even had a month yet of this. And so we're at a very early stage, but some of the things that have been described, you know, they are on the radar, both of Natural England as the government's advisor and in part a delivery body on this, uh, but also with central government itself. Uh, one analogy that just might be worth having in mind um, is the sites of special scientific interest, which are at the very backbone of nature recovery and conservation delivery in this country. If you look at what we're operating now and the regime we've got to uh, protect and manage those places, it's very different to what was first introduced in 1949, where you basically just had a flag raised in the planning system. And that was basically it, you know, the places of scientific interest. And then we had a little bit of process, uh, whereas what we have now is a really sophisticated um, series of checks and balances that enable us to not only register special interest, but, you know, a toolkit that enables us to achieve good outcomes for nature. And so we're on day one, pretty much, with biodiversity net gain. And so the journey ahead is going to be as important as the journey that got us to this point. And, you know, some of the things that were mentioned a moment ago, the on-site, off-site thing, this is one of the biggest, as far as I can see, and the extent to which, uh, you know, we, we've got this very strong steer to say that we will um, seek to deliver the biodiversity net gain on the, on the, on, within the red line of the development, which, which raises all sorts of questions. And, uh, you know, actually, you know, th this is important to note in the context of discussions that I was involved with 10 years ago, um, whereby ecologists were saying, actually, what we should do with this biodiversity net gain idea um, is we should bundle up all the credits, you know, for example, from the south of England, where we've got a lot of development coming and the environment's pretty degraded already. And we should turn it into some really big schemes that we can do, you know, proper landscape scale recovery uh, using those credits all bundled together. And the choice was made, actually, you know, to say, well, um, that's one way of doing it. Another way of thinking about it is to recognise that the damage is being done locally. Therefore, the benefit should be seen locally. And there are political drivers with that as well, in so far as people who are, you know, against housing coming into their locality. And bear in mind, there is a lot of that across the country. It's a real challenge for the developers and meeting housing needs is the extent to which people locally are saying, actually, we don't want houses here. And so being able to say, well, we will create a net gain here as a result of the houses, it can make a difference to the reaction amongst some communities. So there are good reasons why the um, focus has been made to the on-site delivery. Now, on-site delivery in some places where there's a lot of space and you've got a big development area, it can be quite straightforward, especially if there's not very high quality habitat. In other places, you may say, um, you know, we're really constrained here uh, in the sense of the, you know, the red line is, is quite constrained. We want to put quite a lot of houses in. Therefore, there's not much space to do the biodiversity net gain. And you may say, you know, OK, it's not viable here. We'll have to go somewhere else with that. And then that's when you get the off-site demand building in. Now, in terms of the register piece, 
and the extent to which we've got a good handle on what is happening with the on-site and how good the delivery is. Um, this is something which um, is a practical thing. So we've got a register with off-site, but we don't have a register, a national register uh, with on-site. And the reason for that was um, really concerns about overwhelming local planning authorities with um you know a massive burden uh that you know might be uh practically uh unmanageable in the short term but the long-term intention is to bring this in and to have all of the biodiversity net gain included on the register um over time and you know the other, the other points that were made i think maybe mentioned that the, the metric and you know the, the need to keep that under review and we will and so we're in a cycle with government um, to revisit this as we go along. And so there are various things that we will go back and advise ministers with, uh, including the metric, including the on-site register, and any other um, questions that begin to emerge. But local planning authorities, they do have powers to enforce. Um, there are ways in which the on-site uh, material uh, is made available via planning portals. It's harder to see rather than in one place. Um, but th th these things will be there for people to scrutinise. And, you know, I mean, this is such an important step in building a marketplace for, for nature, conservation and recovery in England, um, that we, we do need to get this right. And, you know, some of the basics we know about, um, well, some of the basics that are beginning to emerge about how ecosystem markets can work. One is the kind of, you know, the need for the legal underpinning linked to principles like the polluter pays principle, which is what we've got here. You know, you're causing damage, you, you clean up the damage. Polluter pays is reflected there. The extent to which there's clear standards, that's the metric and the extent to which we've got some numbers that everyone can see and everyone's using the same numbers or the same method. And then we've got transparency, which um, in relation to the on-site piece could be made more transparent as we go forward. Uh, but refining all of this, the metrics, the rules, the um, transparency um, is going to be something that will occur over time. But I would encourage everyone um, not to be, um, uh, you know, dismissive of the overall idea because of the need to refine it. Because I, I just go back to my point about sites of special scientific interest. It's the most important thing we've got, uh, but it's evolved over a long period. And I think the same will happen with this. Tony, you'd be amazed how many times I've spoken to clients about don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. And I think, you know, on so many of these topics, whether it's biodiversity specifically or wider climate issues, yeah. actually getting started doing something is really powerful. Exactly. And Morgan, I mean, so this probably leads into a point that's come up a few times in the chat as well. Um, when it comes to actually designing sites, you've got the, the mandatory BNG requirement now, but you also have a number of developers, both in the residential and commercial space, looking at their broader ESG strategies. How are you weaving those um, uh, different elements together, I suppose, with your clients? Yeah, so we, I mean, for a start, we've people when we're looking at ESG in relation to asset management, not just new development, we're wanting to speak the same language as the development teams. So we're using and finding that uh, it's becoming mainstream to use the concept of BNG in uh, defining KPIs for ESG-led strategies, and importantly, that people are starting to capture biodiversity within. ESG reporting um, and with the advent of things like TNFD, as, as Phoebe mentioned earlier, um, that will see uh, regulatory requ requirements for those that are not just building new things, but managing existing assets to uh, acknowledge the operational impacts of, of their business, as well as the embodied ecological impact of any uh, any future development. So uh, we are starting to, we, we, we've set plenty of precedents now where we are setting BNG linked KPIs for asset managers to address, effectively this allows us to address shifting baseline syndrome. So it's us saying that, look, the impact has already occurred in lots of these places. And in the same way as we would with embodied carbon and operational carbon, we're borrowing the models that our colleagues in that space are, are, are applying and using the concepts of BNG and the metric to say, this is how you can deliver a measurable improvement across your managed asset portfolio or across land that you manage. This is how that BNG relates to ecosystem service improvement and therefore 
embedded resilience of your assets to climate change, therefore also allowing us to link this to TCFD disclosures. So let's say that, that someone's identifying risks in relation to surface flood risk or overheating across an asset portfolio through TCFD, we can deliver a BNG-led uh, biodiversity strategy to address the climate-related risks that those properties or, or, or that land is subject to. Um, and increasingly, we're now starting to view uh, mechanisms uh, in, in where we can translate BNG uh, to embodied ecological impact of new construction materials, for example. And that's where the TNFD comes in. So we're actually just finishing. So Green Gage have, have worked with Brookfield and, and the BBP to create some uh, UK real estate sector guidance for how to apply TNFD. And within that, we are using the concepts of BNG and the DEFRA metric to, to start to look at operational impacts and importantly that's positive or negative so looking at how we can set measurable improvements in biodiversity and, th and and that is this is the connection between our colleagues working in carbon and energy and built form sustainability and us as ecologists because it allows us to connect the dots and bng is this is this way in for us um also using metrics such as the uh, environmental benefits from nature tool which is uh, another emerging metric from from natural england and and you know, oxford i'll also chip in very quickly on that uh compliance issue in that it is rightly really big and funny enough we're actually just about to start a project with one of the larger london boroughs to retrospectively look at and who have been asking for bng for several years via uh, the London plan and and translation of the MPPF, um, and to look at actually on the ground what BNG has been delivered against the BNG that was committed to in planning documentation. Albeit, obviously, that's not driven by legislation; it was policy, but it will still give us a pretty good guide on the rate of compliance of on-site BNG delivery. Because anecdotally, we are finding that prior to BNG being uh, a mechanism a vast number of sites are failing to deliver the on-site biodiversity commitments, especially in an urban and peri-urban environment. I completely get it, Morgan. And I think, you know, just practically thinking about where I live at home, actually, you know, it was a new build set of houses 15 years ago. What it looked like 15 years ago and what it looks like now is, is different because people have cars they want to park or kids want to play football. And, you know, these aren't bad problems, but it's just that reality of how sites are used and managed is very complex. Well, that, that's one of the interesting things that there'll need to be an element of for for lots of developments, certainly as as this evolves, there'll need to be an element of adaptability and and we'll need to react to how places are used and and what that might mean for the BNG outcomes for developments after they've been completed. So I, I think there's going to need to be some sort of response um, in, in how we can reactively address land use changes after the fact. Um, Hannah's in the chat has asked, you know, what an example of good looks like. I, I probably isn't time to describe it now, but if you can think of any that we could go and research after this, is there an example of what good looks like from being done on site? Um, but there, there's one uh, just outside Cambridge. Um, I, I'm not sure of, of how the, the kind of arrangements were made in relation to the BNG discussion, but a new development at Trumpington Meadows um, involved the creation of a wetland and lake and some grassland and some scrub um, next to the development, which would which would have naturally been inside the red line, I would guess. And um, th this is a very high quality piece of ecological um, uh, capacity that's been created there. And actually talking of use and how the place is used, the, the design is rather clever with a ditch surrounding the wetland that basically keeps naturally keeps dog walkers out um, from the place where you get, you know, you get a, a pretty big number of snipe wintering there. Um, during migration, you get common sandpipers turning up. And what was there the other day? There was a short-eared owl there the other day over wintering. And th this is next to a very urban site. The stone chats you can see there. Um, there's a black-headed gulls have moved in. Um, so th that is quite a nice one, just to my kind of anecdotal kind of estimation as I go around and look at things whereby you can see, and it was a wheat field before, uh, you can see a real uplift uh, in the nature right next to a very busy, heavily used um, bit of green space next to a, a built development. But it's the design which I think has, has really cleverly helped to, to bring the people close to the nature without, without undermining it. And there's hides built, there's places where you can look with binoculars across the water. 
uh, and you can see some really nice stuff with a five minute walk from some houses and some local kind of assets that were already there, including a little chalk stream coming down that flows down towards the centre of Cambridge and then joins the cam uh, is blended into this. And uh, I think they've done pretty well. But um, actually, the place, I mean, it's always complicated, isn't it? The place at the moment um, is, is being um, influenced by the creation of a new station the hospital and so some of the uh work that was done a few years ago to to put in some scrub habitat and what have you that's just now been removed and i i know that there were grass snakes and water voles down there um so that's not necessarily a, a a brilliant um further development on the original um biodiversity that was created but this of course is one of the things that will now change is that there will be a law that requires you to keep that stuff for 30 years whereas this stuff predates that it was part of a an arrangement that, that came before the current biodiversity net gain. Um, but there are good examples, I think, is what, what I'm getting to. And, you know, the the uh, the, 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 the big thing um, for many of the these habitat creations is going to be the visitor pressure. And, you know, the 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 uh, you know, the disturbance of ground nesting birds, of reptiles and everything else um, and the effect of dogs, you know, the, 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 this is a big deal. And um, but, you know, through clever design, you can do something about some of that. Tony, I mean, you, you talk about there about a brilliant example, but you unfortunately had to conclude that some of the habitat had been lost. I mean, yeah. probably this leads more to, to Phoebe in terms of, you know, where the um, private and public or, um, start to blend together. I mean, we've heard that local authorities don't have the resource and realistically, unless anyone's got a magic wand in their pocket, they're not going to get it anytime soon. Where can private finance and particularly the sort of verification and government system or governance systems that can come with private finance, how can the um, uh, man or the compliance market learn from what's being done in the voluntary market? Uh, sorry, uh, is that a question for me or for Tony? Well, so I think it's for you. I, basically, what I want to know is, and it comes from some of the comments in the chat here, is we've got all these sort of grand ambitions, but local authorities don't have the resource to deliver it. What is the pr uh, private sector doing to maintain governance and can they be applied into this mandatory market? Yeah, I think um, it's a really good question. And I think um, in terms of the, the actual governance, I think it's really important to uh, have a separate um, some, someone who's setting the terms of the agreement and then a separate body to accredit or certify what's going on. So um, that's applied in a number of um, voluntary markets such as uh, UK Woodland Carbon Code and the Peatland Code. They have um, separate bodies who come in and say, actually, uh, by the terms that the codes have set, we believe that this is being maintained to a standard. And that sort of separation of the two entities means um, uh, there's no systemic risk there of, of things um, being passed by for the sake of uh, continuing the agreement. Um, so I think that's a really good lesson learned from the from the voluntary market. Um, and I know that's being taken up um, in BNG with um, the creation of responsible bodies in particular, people, uh, organisations like, like charities and ENGOs who um, are encouraged to become responsible bodies. They will know what proper governance and proper maintenance looks like, and they're incentivized to, to make sure that happens. Um, but I also think fundamentally private finance can play a much greater role because uh, essentially they can help meet the upfront costs in a way that um, local government and the and the buyers and the sellers uh, just can't because there is not enough cash flow. So if you have an, an investor, and when I say investor, I mean uh, someone who's prepared to give debt or equity, um, repayable finance, essentially, if they give enough money up front to, um, to see all these systems be in place and have the groundwork be done and, and the ecological surveying and making sure that the BNG plans are right for the local environment, um, they can wait, uh, they have that capacity to wait for the market value of the units to be realised. And if, you know, if you wait in BNG for habitats to become established, 
um, then you you have more units to sell, I believe is the way the metric works. So, so they are patient enough, they can be patient enough to wait for that uplift to happen. They get their financial return for waiting for those uh, however many years that takes. And what you get is a much more robust agreement um, hopefully a robust, more robust agreement that's underpinned by um, strong legal contracts, because I think uh, any investor in any private um, scheme, um, people will talk about strength of contracts and making sure everything's crystal clear. So uh, the private sector and the finance sector are quite good at making sure things are airtight um, when you're putting pen to paper and you're you're signing on the dotted line. So I think those are just a couple of examples from the voluntary market and from the private sector that um, that we can take forward. But, you know, it's a great question. And I'd also be keen to know how, um, you know, uh, think how we can take lessons from the biodiversity net gain market to the voluntary market and to private finance as well. So things like 10% gain, immediately that's a yes from me, not just mitigating the impact, making an additional contribution back to, to nature. And um, the focus on the Lawton principle of bigger, better, more joined up habitats, that's all stuff that we can definitely share between this compliance space and the voluntary space. I think so. If you add into that, it, one thing that immediately jumps to my mind is the metric. And I know we've talked about some limitations of the metric, but to have an attempt of a, some universal tool that compares mm -hmm. all these different habitat types. I mean, think how powerful the carbon markets could be if we had one universal calculator, for example. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a huge potential there. And I mean, I, I'm already seeing people look at the voluntary biodiversity space using the DEFRA metric as a sort of proxy calculator across it. And that's you know powerful in my opinion. Mm, I agree. Indeed, it um, is. Tony, there's a couple of questions in here, and um, you know, carefully your answer because Phoebe's admitted to being a farmer's daughter, and I'm a farmer's son. But they're they're here really looking at saying, okay, BNG is a, a different land use, but we've got challenges that have been created by agriculture. I think a lot of people have to accept that, that has been the case. And also there were need to feed a nation um, and that's feed as in direct food into humans, but also energy crops, you know, solar farms, all these other competing uses of land. How do you see BNG sites in 30 years time and or changes to the metric to allow the sort of layering of these multiple benefits together? Yeah. Um, so um, uh, let, let me just deal with the food security piece uh, first. Um, so, of course, we must have um, a very high level of domestic food production for reasons of, of food security in the very uncertain world that we live in. Uh, and actually, the uncertainty of the world we live in is impacting on farming here at the moment. We've heard this morning the headlines about much of England being underwater. And I've seen farmers out of train windows and car windows over recent days, you know, absolutely inundated and trying to get machinery in and out you can't do it really and crops are not growing and everything else so we're already into a period of volatility um, caused by some of the global change that's underway so we we do have to focus on food security but um you know this is something that we need to to recognize is not a binary choice i mean if if you if you think about all the sectors of the economy which are essential for the well-being of society probably the one that is most dependent on a healthy environment is agriculture you know soil health pollinators natural pest control stable climate water you know all of these things depend on the environment functioning so to see a choice between a healthy environment and agriculture is just such a false choice as, as to be meaningless. So we need to get beyond that. And most of the farmers I speak to are already far beyond it. You know, you, you get pundits and you get some commentary in the media. I think most people can see that we have to do both. Um, it's not either or, it's both and. And so then the, the, the challenge is how do you do both and? And so one of the things that is good about biodiversity net gain in the both and space is the extent to which it's a market mechanism, thereby for quite a lot of it, um, will be people making judgments about what is the best thing to do with their land. And so if you're farming uh, an area of land and some of it's really good for food production and some of it is not good for food production, you will put the biodiversity net gain on the bit that's not good for food production. And, you know, that's the beauty of, of this particular way of doing things is that it invites people to offer what they think is a rational choice for them. And farmers, you know, the most rational thing they do is produce food. 
And so if they want to join this market at the same time as producing food, they will make good choices. They're not going to put biodiversity net gain on the best land. One thing that I think puts this into perspective is um, a piece of analysis that was done by Henry Dimbleby and his team for the National Food Strategy published a couple of years ago, whereby they estimated that if you took um, the least productive fifth of England's agricultural land, so land that's producing some food at the moment, um, if you took 20% of that and said, OK, this is now for carbon and nature recovery, um, you would reduce food output, uh, calories output by 3%. So you take a fifth and you reduce by 3%. If we cut our food waste by 10%, so the 30% we're currently wasting, if you cut that by 10%, you get that 3% back straight away. And so, you know, the, 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 that's just to, I'm just trying to highlight the um, the ways in which some of these choices may not be as damaging for food production as we might initially kind of be led to believe. This then, uh, you know, I just mentioned market mechanisms, which are critically important in being able to make good choices. The other thing to bear in mind um, is that food and nature are not the only two things that we need in England from our land. We need infrastructure, water, energy, transportation, we need housing. We spent some time talking about that in relation to BNG this morning. We need carbon capture. Um, we need places for people to have recreation. We need places for industry. We need places for natural resources production. So we're going to probably want some more quarries at some point. We're certainly going to want more timber. And we've got targets for wood production uh, and, and tree cover. And so you start putting all these things together and you realise there's actually really quite a lot of pressure on the land here, um, then leading to... Some people, including a House of Lords committee um, quite recently saying the country needs a land use framework. We need to understand how to accommodate all of that. What we do at the moment, and BNG is a step to um, take us into a better place, what we tend to do at the moment is have an argument about two at once. And so a familiar two at once is food versus nature. Another one which is quite familiar is building versus the green belt. Another one is renewable energy versus a beautiful view. Um, etc cetera, etc cetera. and th these are all very interesting discussions but they don't answer the big question which is what is the optimum use of England's land we've got 56 million people here we've got 130,000 square kilometers we want food we want houses we want nature recovery we want clean rivers we want energy security uh you name it and it's got to fit in that space and so that then, you know, leads to some bigger thinking about how we get the maximum out of the land. And actually, that brings me to the bit about the co-benefits, because um, ideally what we would do with biodiversity net gain, and uh, Morgan's touched on this a little bit already, is that as we get the biodiversity benefit, ideally what we would also get is a flood risk reduction benefit, a carbon benefit, a public health and well-being benefit, uh, and maybe a bit of river cleanup benefit if we do it in a clever, smart way. And I think, you know, given that squeeze between supply and demand, i.e. millions of people wanting an awful lot out of the bit of land that we've got, the more that we can layer benefits on top of each other on the same hectare of land, the better. And, you know, biodiversity is a great tool to help us into that discussion, really. And, uh, you know, I, I think for me, this is probably the biggest kind of conceptual breakthrough that we need to make as a country over the coming years as we grapple with sustainability and climate and nature questions is to think through how we're going to do that integrated thinking to accommodate all of these pressures and demands um, as efficiently as possible including by layering them on top of each other in the same place i completely agree and much of my work advising landowners is we no longer have the luxury of monosyllabic land use. Yeah. We have to build these things together. And um, you know, ultimately that's that can be done in a clever design way. Um, Morgan, just picking up a couple of questions from the chat here, and I'm afraid we're not gonna have time to answer everything in the chat, but something that's coming up as a theme is we need skills in this industry. It's, it's had a rapid explosion and there's just frankly not enough skilled people to be able to really answer these big questions. Where can people get started? I mean, you, you say you came from an ecology background. What training is available? What things should people be looking for? How do we encourage people into this sector? I'm actually a marine biologist in in my my, my original training at ecotoxicology. Even it's not even a not even pure ecology. Um, so. Uh, I, for a start, you're, it's totally right. We have a shortage. There are not enough ecologists to deliver 
the ecology consultancy work that is needed. That's in part because some of the larger linear infrastructure projects in recent years have taken a lot of uh, a lot of the industry, made them focus very much on specific species assessment skills. They've got there are a lot of ecologists that are very good at going out and doing a protected species surveys, but not necessarily at doing the botany. So botanical skills are a key uh, underpinning skill for BNG that uh, is just lacking amongst lots of ecologists and importantly the things that, that underpin the calculation of bng is very accurate botanical assessment of habitats to define it to uk hab standards um so any ecologist starting out i would say for a start if if i were going back into uni now i would would do exactly the same i would do a an environmental sciences degree i would do an, eco, an ecology degree um because it is a very desirable skill to have now but i would ensure i was focusing on my botanical skills and importantly the consultancy skills so the soft skills of actually being able to communicate why this matters because it's not just a matter like i say of making the numbers work it's ensuring that we share the narrative capture and uh educate uh our clients on the ecosystem service code benefits they can get by delivering above minimum standard bng it's also for a start we're always pushing for beyond the 10 percent because if, if every development were just to deliver the 10 percent we wouldn't address that that shifted baseline that i kind of alluded to we need and that's where this this esg argument comes in but being able to communicate why that matters and how it can add value to a development through improved carbon capture, through reduced surface flood risk, for example, is a really key skill that is lacking amongst ecologists as well. So it's this holistic thinking of or this systems thinking of it's not just the biodiversity, it's this, it's this wider um, concept. And yeah, th there are enough people that can do that. Um, I don't know the answer. We're, it, it's a, it's genuinely, it's a constant, um, it's a constant debate amongst ecologists and, and particularly in Green Gauge as we kind of grow. It's, um, yeah, it's a challenge. If, if it's any um, help on this, I mean, I think we find recruiting for people with specialist environmental knowledge much easier than those, uh, or desire, I should say, uh, much easier than for, for other parts of the sector. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's, quite exciting to think that nature is cool right now yeah. um and phoebe will probably test as well there's plenty of money trying to pour its way into nature recovery i i don't believe nature is a shortage hmm. um tell you my, my last question we've got three minutes um are you concerned by the amount of money that is coming into this sector is it detracting from what is ultimately trying to be achieved um I think the money that's coming in is insufficient. Uh, we, we need a lot more money to be coming in. You know, the, the scale of the job that needs to be done uh, in restoring uh, nature in this country is huge. And at the moment, you know, what we can uh, bring in from the statutory side, um, actually, it's pretty considerable. So the Environment Agency have got a multi-billion pounds uh, flood budget, for in, for instance. Some of that is now going to be spent more on nature-based solutions. That couldn't be more welcome. Um, we have the agriculture budget, of course, which is now explicitly shifted from an area based payment system now into payments for public goods. And, you know, the elaboration of that is ongoing. Uh, we've now got now got um, uh, more money coming into natural England, which, of course, is going um, all of it's going towards nature recovery. Uh, and now we've got uh, the complement of the private finance coming in. But it's not as as big as it needs to be uh, to be able to change behaviour at the scale that's required. And so the BNG, I can't remember the figures as to how much it's going to bring in. It's going to be a couple of hundred million max, isn't it? Something like that, um, which is great. Um, but it's not in the domain of the billions that's needed and so we are going to have to find ways of mobilizing more of the private finance into the landscape and some of the things have been touched on already today you know the carbon uh, side we've got a couple of voluntary schemes the woodland carbon code and the peatland carbon code um but we've got a whole plethora of different kind of metrics and number kind of crunching approaches that are applying in the agricultural uh, domain. I know DEFRA are doing a piece of work to try and work out how best to manage that. But for some people who are managing land and who would like to look at this, it does feel a little bit like the Wild West, I think is how they would describe it on the carbon side. And so how can we create uh, ways to unlock more of this money um, to come alongside uh, the, the, the the public investment? I think that's a key question. And I said already, I think some of the things that I, I would say are going to be important. 
clear standards so that everyone knows what good looks like in terms of outcomes, uh, a requirement to do things. So BNG is a requirement to do something. The other compliance market we have at the moment is nutrient neutrality. That's bringing some money into uh, the landscape in some parts of the country. But otherwise, we're really working with voluntary markets. And, you know, nothing wrong with voluntary markets if they're driving the money in. But if they're not driving the money in, then obviously they're not really doing what needs to be to be done. Uh, so, you know, I think we're still at quite an early stage in all of this. And, you know, the promise of private investment uh, into nature recovery, uh, it's a really important thing, but it's not going to happen just on its own. I think it is going to require policy. It is going to require guide rails. It is going to require official agencies like ourselves and the Environment Agency to be able to give um, confidence to investors and indeed providers supplying, you know, the environmental benefits that actually what they're doing is going to be seen as good. It's not going to be a reputational risk or it's not going to fall over and people are going to lose their money. Uh, you know, to, to, to minimise those risks uh, is something that can be done um, through the public sector being involved and, and helping to, to create confidence. So we've got a long way to go, I think. But, you know, the, the, the value of nature to the economy, it's absolutely huge. And one of the gravest omissions and misconceptions that characterises our modern world is to think that nature is worth nothing. I mean, this is how economics treats the natural world to a large extent. We do economic growth and development, we measure GDP, but nobody's measuring the running down of the natural assets that underpin the whole system. And we've got to correct that. And so, um, you know, what we're talking about today is one step, but we've got to go a lot further. I think, Tony, there's a, there's a point there for all of us on this, um, both in terms of answering the questions. We got so far through, but we certainly didn't get all the way through, so we'll try and pick up some of those separately. Um, thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Tony. Really helpful debate today. And I think I'm handing back to Emma just to close us off. Yeah, thanks, John. So just um, on behalf of Carl's ESG Forum, just thank you so much to all our panellists for taking the time this morning and for sharing your really helpful insights and also to Savills who are the sponsor of Coles and apologies we haven't managed to get through all of the Q&A it's been quite a lot but we will follow up on this uh, complex topic at some point in the future I'll just take a second to plug our next event in May which is on uh, the role of ESG in valuation so looking at brown discounts and green premiums more details will follow uh, shortly but it would be great if you could join us then um, and in the meantime, if you have any feedback, it would be great if you could send that to Ali Young, who is the Coles secretary or via the Coles LinkedIn page. And with that, I will wish everyone a very happy Wednesday. Hope you have a good day all and thanks a lot.